Hello and welcome to Law Institute Conversations, a podcast in which Law Institute researchers, as some of the world's leading experts, delve into the big issues in international affairs. My name is Alexander Dayant and I am a research fellow here at the Institute. Today, I am delighted to be speaking with Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Professor Sachs is widely considered to be one of the world's leading experts on economic development, global macroeconomics, and the fight against poverty. He is university professor and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, and has been an advisor to three different United Nations Secretaries General. He currently serves as a Sustainable Development Goals Advocate under UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, but also as the president of the UN Sustainable Development Solution Network, through which he publishes his monthly podcast called Book Club with Jeffrey Sachs, that I would highly recommend. It is also worth mentioning that Professor Sachs is no stranger to the Lowy Institute, with this being the third time we have been lucky enough to have him speak to us. The first two were in 2005 and later in 2013, when he visited the Institute to talk about his latest book and to deliver a speech called The Common Wealth. So clearly, it's time for a catch-up. Professor Sachs, thank you very much for taking the time to speaking with me today. It's a pleasure to be with you, and uh, I'm sorry that it's taken eight years <laughs> since uh, last visit to Lowy. That's all right. Better, better late than never. Uh, it's great to be with you. First, I would like to talk about global cooperation and global policy architecture in the time of COVID-19. At the moment, developed economies are now clearly experiencing a substantial economic recovery from the depth of the initial lockdown last year. But in developing and emerging economies, this is a whole different story where public health effects and economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic continue to be devastating. And this despite many measures implemented by the international community to support the developing world, such as the debt service standstill announced by the G20 for the poorest countries and the COVID-19 Vaccine Global Access Facility, or, or COVAX. My, my first question is, what went wrong? What is your view on the international response to COVID-19? You know, basically, uh, the international system, unfortunately, does not hang together very well right now. Uh, Last year was the worst. Uh, not only was the pandemic uh, overtaking our politics and uh, each of our countries, but we had uh, Donald Trump as president. Uh, the U.S. Uh, ostensibly is a major country in the international scene. Uh, the U.S. thinks of itself as being the central country, but Trump was a, a psychopath uh, and absolutely incapable of honest behavior either uh, within the United States or internationally. So uh, try to have global cooperation with a psychopathic president who, whose uh, motto is America first. Uh, it just doesn't work. And many, many things were undermined uh, from the start of the pandemic. There was no common understanding of what to do. Uh, there was no sharing of uh, experiences or best practices. Uh, actually, of course, uh, Australia was part of a region that uh, the only region that uh, did relatively well in suppressing the transmission. So Australia and uh, neighbor New Zealand uh, and then other countries of East Asia, uh, China, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Vietnam, uh, Korea, Japan had uh, relative success uh, to a varying extent in containing the uh, virus. But when I tried in the United States to say, look at the experience uh, in Australia or look at the experience uh, in the Asia Pacific region, we should do something like that here. There was zero possibility during the Trump period. Uh, and even now uh, with uh, a sane president uh, and a, a, a good administration, it's very, very hard to learn lessons or to get much purchase on global cooperation. Now, two more things uh, should be mentioned. One is that real cooperation requires real money. Uh, and uh, this is something that rich countries don't like to think about, talk about, uh, or contribute. So the rich countries uh, raised emergency financing uh, that was very substantial. Uh, the IMF puts the COVID spending of the advanced economies. It's something like $17 trillion extra in the U.S. alone, more than $6 trillion. But none of it went to the world. It was all for 
domestic purposes. It didn't dawn on Congress. It certainly never went through the head of that dingbat president of ours uh, that uh, any of that money should go to the rest of the world. So we contributed nothing financially in 2020. Uh, the second major issue is that the U.S. is on a kind of war path with China uh, in, in the whole midst of this. This is independent of the pandemic. Uh, it's something that was brewing beforehand. Uh, the pandemic uh, exacerbated uh, it for a number of reasons, uh, tactical, political, the fact that we had a, an election in the United States. And so anti-China uh, rhetoric was uh, part of the political scene. But that made it uh, even especially hard to have cooperation because when you're not only not reaching out, but actually in a deliberate way antagonistic uh, between the two major countries, well, that pretty much uh, makes uh, cooperation impossible. Let, let me say that uh, in 2021, things have been better for sure. I think a notable positive is the agreement in the IMF on the $650 billion of special drawing rights appropriations. This is a, a good thing. It would not have happened with Trump. Uh, in fact, he opposed it. Uh, it did happen with uh, Biden. Uh, it is a, a significant action. Uh, and there are glimmers of cooperation in other areas. Uh, uh, the United States is donating vaccines to COVAX, which is a good idea and a practical failure to date, in my opinion, although they would dispute that. I'm not supposed to say that. That's not politically correct, but I don't think it's been successful. Um, but having said that, cooperation still remains quite weak for the reasons I've mentioned. Lack of international financing, U.S.-China antipathy uh, and, uh, and uh, friction. Um, rusty institutions, uh, inward looking uh, governments, uh, the fact that the United States is no leader anymore. We're just lucky to have both feet on the ground on any given day. Um, and so all of this adds up to a quite difficult international scene. You're right. I think um, the, the, the Biden administration comes with new initiatives. So you mentioned the IMS special drawing rights, but like there's also like the, you know, the corporate taxation and there's more action on climate change. So, I mean, to me, it looks like there is a, a, a renewed support uh, for global cooperation from, from, from America. It, it's a, it, it is good news. And, and uh, the Treasury Secretary is one of my favorite people uh, because uh, Janet Yellen was my professor of macroeconomics. Uh, in the 1970s. <laughs> and uh, so I go back a long way and she's absolutely wonderful. But it's important to understand the United States Senate is divided 50-50, uh, exactly down the line. Uh, on any given day, uh, it is absolutely a coin flip on whether the president can get something through the Senate. The Congress is also on a knife edge. Uh, we'll have our midterm elections in November 2022 in the United States. They come every two years. Uh, we are not a functioning country uh, to this moment. So uh, President Biden is a decent man and the administration is good. Uh, but the United States is a dysfunctional country. Uh, it is not capable of sustained global leadership. We don't even know whether it's capable of uh, holding itself together, frankly. Uh, because politics uh, are so uncertain. Uh, and uh, one uh, Australian uh, semi-transplant, uh, Rupert Murdoch, does more damage to American democracy than just about any uh, single person uh, in the world, uh, because every day we have lies and ranting on Fox News and in the Wall Street Journal. And the result of all of this is a lot of instability. So this is the reason why Though I like the administration a lot, uh, and I could point to positive things, I think it's important for uh, the Lowy Institute to know this is a fragile situation in the United States of a deeply divided country. Uh, the culture of cooperation, even internally, is just miserable. Uh, the instincts for international cooperation are very weak uh, and 
even today, the Biden administration's idea of cooperation is the alliance of democracies, not cooperation with China and uh, through the UN especially. And this, this makes all of this quite tenuous, I'm sorry to say. Don't you think that um, to foster this international cooperation you're talking about, we actually uh, need a good international policy architecture? I mean, what do you think of the current the current system? You know, you are very vocal against the G7, but uh, don't we need such an intergovernmental political forum to manage global cooperation efforts? We need several different uh, overlapping uh, uh, and concentric layers of cooperation. First, uh, countries have to get their own act together. Uh, and when uh, they are federal like Australia or uh, like the United States, uh, it even means cooperation within states that uh, is not so simple. Uh, then we need regional cooperation because there is no problem that we face, whether it is the pandemic or energy systems or migration or any other challenge that can be solved by a nation alone. Uh, and all of our problems have strong regional dimensions to them. And so I'm absolutely in favor of regional cooperation as a basic pillar for global problem solving. That's why I'm really against regions that are divided, say China on one side and Uh, Australia, uh, Japan, Korea on another side, on the U.S. side. This this is very mistaken uh, idea of uh, how politics can work in the 21st century. So I'm a big fan, for example, in in uh, the Asia Pacific region of RCEP, of, of uh, the 15 countries of Northeast Asia, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and and the 10 countries of Uh, ASEAN cooperating together. Uh, that is very sensible. Then we need global cooperation around UN institutions. And the UN remains essential for this. But also, you mentioned the G7, some intermediary global bodies can really be helpful. And I'm a fan of the G20 more than of the G7. Uh, the G7 was a, a club of the rich countries that started to come together uh, under French and German leadership in the 1970s. And at that point, the G7 countries, uh, which are uh, the US, Japan, Canada, uh, UK, France, Italy, uh, and Germany, They had more than 50% of world output. Uh, they seem to run the world economically. But uh, by the turn of the 21st century, uh, with the rise of China, with the rise of uh, several uh, emerging economies, it, to my mind, made no sense to still have a meeting of uh, rich countries alone. And I recommended back in 1998 that we go from a G8 which was G7 plus Russia at the time, to a G16, adding in eight uh, developing countries. Uh, something like that was taken up. It became the G20 uh, with the finance ministers meeting in, in uh, 1999 uh, and then heads of state meeting uh, after the 2008 financial crisis. That's a very useful body. Uh, and interestingly, uh, this year, It has the presidency in Italy next year, and I think very much relevant for Australia, the presidency of the G20 is in Indonesia. So it will be the Bali 2022 summit of the G20 countries. And that can be a very constructive place for problem solving because just the 20 have about 85% of the world GDP within them, about 63% of the world's population. I've suggested recently add in one chair for the African Union, like the European Union, which is a, the 20th member. Uh, and then we would add in 1.4 billion more people, another 17% of the world population, another 3% of world GDP. And we really have a terrifically representative body also. 
The advantage of the G20 or G21, just to mention quickly, is that in the UN, you have universal representation, but it's a pretty ponderous institution. I love it. I work for it uh, and uh, I, I believe in it. But we need something more flexible and more financially and economically oriented, if only to take proposals to the whole UN system. So the G20, G21 is important, and I think we could make a lot of it. But all of this is to say <laughs> cooperation is the only way forward. The idea that we're going to invest a lot of time and energy in uh, an alliance of democracies, for example, strikes me as just a wrong-headed idea, uh, especially when <laughs> my own democracy barely functions. We had our insurrection uh, in January, and who knows where it's going. But the idea is don't make divisions that you then amplify in the world. Let's build the mechanism so that we can solve problems together. Yes, let's talk more about global cooperation, but in the context of uh, vaccine distribution. From the start of the pandemic, in the provision of masks and personal protective equipment, the competitive instincts of nations has become even more flagrant. Vaccine diplomacy and its alter ego vaccine nationalism followed this trend. This is regrettable and counterproductive, but it also seemed inevitable because most countries are self-interested. And to an extent, the selfish approach is actually rational and has undoubtedly domestic political advantages. So my question to you is this. Do you really believe the situation could have gone differently in other settings? How do you convince a country to prioritize the distribution of vaccines to a population more at risk in, let's say, a neighboring country, rather than focusing on its own population? I think we should uh, see the vaccine issue uh, in, a, um, uh, in a holistic way, starting with the, the fact that it's a kind of miracle that we have around 10 vaccines right now uh, within a short period of time after the emergence of a, a new pathogen, uh, there was a lot of scientific readiness, especially for a SARS-like virus. There had been a lot of work on uh, coronavirus that NIH and others had pursued, uh, that China had pursued, uh, Europe and, and so forth. Uh, and there were vaccine platforms like the new mRNA platform that NIH had been funding basically for 20 years. So this is a good news. The scientific establishment and the technological state of affairs in the world is, uh, is in overdrive in, in general. It's, uh, it's the one amazing system that works is technological advance and the scientific research community. It's a great gift for humanity. But There are many uh, aspects uh, to science and technology that need to be recognized, the most important of which is that they produce public goods, uh, and that's why they're publicly supported and publicly financed. But then when you think about public goods production, in other words, developing a vaccine, uh, it's incumbent upon you to think about how you're going to use the vaccine once it's developed. And I think the United States really falls down on this uh, in a quite simple way, by the way, uh, which is that uh, NIH focuses on getting vaccines out there and doesn't think very uh, creatively, in my opinion, about how they're going to be used afterwards. The NIH model is use public funding and then hand over the intellectual property basically to private companies. And that's uh, the American way. It uh, produces a lot of good science and technology. It enriches a lot of people, uh, a few people, I should say, but uh, it does that pretty reliably. Uh, but it leaves out the question of inclusive use of the uh, drugs and vaccines that are developed. I, I remember at the beginning of Operation Warp Speed, I went to senior U.S. officials. Again, this was the Trump administration, so I wasn't the most welcome voice. But I said, uh, you know, it's, it's not just Operation Warp Speed to get the vaccine. How is it going to be used afterwards? Well, no interest in discussing that. Maybe because uh, they had no interest in cooperation or maybe because that's not the way that they think. I think it's the latter. Their thinking is we're going to get a vaccine in record speed and it's going to be Pfizer or it's going to be Moderna. 
But then it's not us anymore. It's these companies and they should just go out and do their thing. I find this incredible, by the way, weird, uh, because you develop the intellectual property and then you hand it over to a private company with monopoly rights for 20 years under a patent. And then you, somebody says, oh, then let the market function as if there's a market. There's no market anymore. You've just given a monopoly to one or two companies, a monopoly or duopoly. I should be uh, more, more precise in this. And then what happened after that was a scramble. So COVAX uh, was the international institution uh, promoted by WHO, by Gavi, the Vaccine uh, Alliance, by uh, Gates Foundation to get uh, worldwide distribution. But the company said, hey, we can make more money just making side deals with individual governments. And so the world divided uh, into uh, three. Uh, one were the poor countries who had no choice. They went to COVAX. They just got in line. Uh, the second uh, was the rich countries, especially the producing countries said, hey, we made it. We're going to use it. Uh, the United States uh, falls into that category. The EU, the UK, by and large, falls into that category. The third category are countries that said, OK, we'll sign up for COVAX, but you know what? We better make a side deal uh, as well. And nobody said to Pfizer that I know of, hey, you can't make side deals. Uh, this is a global pandemic. This is we need an organization. What are you doing cutting side deals? Uh, nobody says these things. And the other thing that didn't happen, as far as I know, is that senior U.S., Chinese, Russian, U.K., uh, Indian officials, I'm listing the countries uh, that uh, are the progenitors or the producers of the vaccines, I don't think they've ever sat around a table to say, so what's your monthly supply? How can it be ratcheted up? Uh, let's get out a spreadsheet for all of the countries in the world and figure out how we're going to get universal coverage. To this day, as far as I know, I keep saying as far as I know, because I'm not sure what's going on in back rooms, but I try to peer around the, the walls uh, every day. Uh, but as far as I know, I, Pfizer and Moderna are out making individual contracts. COVAX once in a while is getting some doses of vaccines and, uh, and then trying to deliver them. And many of them end up expiring, I think, because they don't get there in time or they end up at uh, airport warehouses because there hasn't been the preparation for the supply chains. And we don't have a plan globally to this moment. So it's a whole morass, in my view, that starts with a wrong concept. The wrong concept is that this is a marketplace. The wrong idea is this is private companies putting their capital on the line in R&D. That's actually not how it works. This is NIH supported for 20 years. Almost all of the original research is academic. Almost all of it, say University of Pennsylvania, which figured out how to make the nucleoside changes in the mRNA to make these vaccines work. Uh, almost all of it is NIH uh, supported all the way through, even to the last moment, the phase one, two, and three clinical trials. Then a monopoly, for heaven's sake, given to this in a pandemic. Who could even imagine such illogic? And that's how the system works right now. And so what we're seeing is uh, really a, a conceptual political blunder at the highest levels. Then you could say, oh, well, but of course, these are self-interested countries. They know exactly what they're doing. It may not be fair. I don't think that even that is right. Uh, I think it's uh, so self-defeating what's going on. Where did Delta come from? Uh, Delta is raging across the world right now. Uh, 
it did not come from within the United States. Uh, it, uh, we're not even sure or, original sites, whether India or, or, or elsewhere, but the fact of the matter is in an interconnected world, you better have coverage on a widespread basis if you are going to even try to avoid the repeated emergence of new variants that can evade uh, immunological uh, uh, protection that can make the breakouts that are clearly underway right now uh, with the Delta and now there's Delta Plus and there's going to be others in the future. So it seems to me a pandemic calls for a global strategy, a global plan. It's interesting, of course, uh, the head of WHO said uh, just uh, recently, don't give boosters before you've even given first doses to developing countries. This is a, a right observation, but it's interesting. He's a, a voice on his own almost. I No developed country stood up and said, yes, yes, uh, of course you're right. Uh, WHO just uh, is, is on its own in this, and uh, the governments uh, are behaving on their own, and the companies are acting like companies, uh, which is understandable. I just don't think they should be allowed to act that way, but they're raising prices right now uh, because, because they can. Uh, th their vaccine dose costs in production an estimated $2.00 and they're charging now more than $20 a dose in Europe. And these companies, BioNTech uh, in Germany and Moderna, have increased their value by combined hundreds of billions of dollars. I think it's said that there are 13 new billionaires created out of this in, in the last uh, 18 months. And, and the companies are not told, no, you can't do that. Uh, this is treated like a market business. It's it's weird to me. Yeah, and I guess this is why you're calling for a COVID-19 intellectual property waiver, right? I, I'm calling for a plan more than anything, which is I'm calling for grown-ups to sit down and say, we need global coverage. What is our plan? How is it going to be produced? Where is it going to be produced? Uh, who's going to pay for it? What are the timelines? What do poor countries need? And uh, IP is something like 97th on the list of concerns uh, to, to me in terms of what needs protection right now, because actually the patents are owned by the U.S. government if they want to use them. They are co-holders of this intellectual property. They paid for it and uh, they don't choose to use it. So in this sense, I'm really looking for a plan, not a tactic. Yeah, I mean, I hear you, but um, I guess like in your in your plan or around the table that you're talking about, there'll be some uh, private companies, uh, profit-driven pharmaceutical corporation that will be here. And you'll have to find um, an argument for them to give away the patent for, for the common good. But don't you think in some ways this would, this would hamper their incentive to produce future vaccines? No, <laughs> first of all, I don't want to ask their opinion. I know their opinion. Their opinion is that we want to be as rich as possible. Uh, and uh, we want NIH to support all clinical trials. We want NIH to fund all this wonderful science. We want NIH to give us all of the IP. Thank you very much. We're really having a great time. So I, I think that the issue is not even to castigate these companies. Companies are doing what companies do. Uh, I'm castigating our governments, uh, which uh, are responsible for the public good, not the private pro uh, profit. And so I want our governments to understand the activity that they're in. I think they do. I, I don't know, but, you know, Pfizer gives a heck of a lot of campaign contributions, for example. They do a lot of lobbying. Uh, they're not a naive, uh, unknown company. They have a lot of friends in Congress. I... I can't uh, draw, connect any dots exactly, but uh, the idea that we should be asking permission by the companies is just a, a, a mistaken idea about what this is about. Aside from everything else, first rule of a pandemic is control it, not run a market economy. Uh, 
I, I go back 20 years to debates at WHO, remember, and WTO, excuse me, uh, World Trade Organization, you know, when uh, the Uruguay round was completed and the U.S. pharmaceutical industry pushed the universalization of TRIPS, uh, of the intellectual property rights system, which was designed by and for the U.S. pharma industry. Uh, and that was really the lobbying group that put TRIPS into place. There was an uproar because uh, at the end of the 1990s, the AIDS pandemic was surging. And so in 2001, and then again in 2005, there were clear agreements reached that said in public health emergencies, IP rights can, indeed should, be overcome for the sake of stopping an epidemic or, in this case, a pandemic. We went through this with AIDS, exactly this debate. So you don't sit around in the middle of a pandemic and say, well, what about future property rights? Uh, the reason being that anyone that holds IP should know that in a global emergency, the IP rights are going to have to be managed in a way to stop the pandemic. That is the point. Now, I would add in the, the pertinent fact that these companies, Pfizer, for example, did not develop the mRNA vaccine. I'm sorry. BioNTech, with a lot of support from NIH and governments did. And so let's be clear about how this works. Moderna had its hand held the whole time by NIH for I don't know how many years, all the way through the basic science, uh, the research, uh, phase one, two, and three clinical trials. This was a government operated uh, uh, system culminating in uh, Operation Warp Speed. So, no, I'm not concerned about uh, the innovation part. I believe we should be putting in huge amounts of public funding for innovation in general. It's in our science and tech world today, it's the highest returns we have other than uh, educating our children and then having them grow up to be good scientists and engineers. Uh, but um, we have a huge social return from all of this, but it's supposed to be managed for the public good. Now, I'd, I'd like to shift completely topic and talk about the environment, climate change, Australia and, and the Pacific, if I may. Please. At the Lowy Institute, um, an important part of research focuses on the Pacific, a region that is extremely vulnerable to the ravages of climate change, a problem, as you know, uh, created almost entirely by rich countries. On the, on the global scale, Australia emits much more than its fair share of carbon dioxide. Its emissions are 1.3% of the global total, but Australians only account for 0.3% of the world population. And despite this, and despite the rhetoric from the government that Australia is doing its job in reducing emissions, Australia is seen as a lagger on the global stage in fighting climate change. And this sentiment is even more acute in the Pacific. But at the same time, Australia provides annually more than 40% of the total aid to the Pacific. And the government continues to invest a large part of its aid program on climate change and disaster resilience support to the Pacific. And as such, the government states that uh, we are a good international actor. Um, would you say this is true? Well, let me say that uh, Australia is a, a wonderful country that should just stop producing coal, period. Uh, th this is the, the basic point. So... Australia has so many wonderful things going for it uh, and uh, so many wonderful people, so many great universities, uh, uh, wonderful uh, society. Um, stop coal. This is so basic. Uh, it, it, it's uh, and, and, and the uh, contortions uh, in Australia to avoid that basic fact are painful. But of course, I also live in Rupert Murdoch alternative reality universe. Uh, and Murdoch, I regard as uh, one of uh, really the most uh, harmful people on the entire planet, uh, who's done more damage on so many issues than just about anybody I know. And he has brought down governments in Australia repeatedly uh, over coal. Uh, and, uh, you know, th this is crude local politics. And I think 
there's, it's not even complicated. There's no place for coal in this world, uh, except perhaps uh, if you figure out some niche ways to uh, capture uh, and sequester uh, the uh, carbon dioxide. So I don't want to rule out some uh, advanced uh, technologies uh, that uh, could directly uh, 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 render harmless uh, the coal and use it to produce hydrogen, for example. There may be something in that. But what Australia is doing of just producing and exporting coal, stop, come on. This is not even close to normal, decent behavior. And it's filled with lies and irresponsibility. And I was really unhappy, by the way, uh, with Australia lobbying aggressively uh, UNESCO to say, no, 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 the, uh, the Great Barrier Reef is not in threat. When the scientific report to the government of Australia in 2019 could not be more explicit, saying that the risk to the reef from global climate change is dire, uh, and uh, possibly irreversible uh, at this point. And so we've got to stop two things. One is coal, and two is propaganda. Just some honest talk. You know, as, as good as the government, let me put it a different way, as bad as this government has been on coal, it's been good on COVID in my view. You know, Australia has done a tremendous job and the uh, national government and the states get a lot of credit. Serious, honest, hard talk, direct action. And the result is you've saved a lot of lives. And uh, just look at the difference of Australia and my completely weird country uh, in terms of uh, deaths per capita. Uh, and Australia is something like 150th of uh, the U.S. or 160th of the U.S. So congratulations. And that has come through honesty. The government actually said we're going to listen to the scientists, to the public health officials. We're going to put a prioritization on the common good, on life. And the results have been very good. Now, speed up the vaccinations, that's for sure, to the extent possible. But as good as it's been on this, it's been bad on climate change. And it's really not complicated, by the way. Uh, it's not subtle. Uh, it's not close scientific calls. It's just politics and Murdoch. And it's got to stop. And by the way, we're all rooting for Australia to be a, a, a hub of global hydrogen. That's a good thing. Uh, Australia could use its technology, its leadership, uh, make a very good business and do it in a zero carbon way. So I think there are tremendous opportunities. And by the way, I love the idea of a, of a submarine cable carrying Australia's wonderful sunshine to Southeast Asia, because if you think regionally, Australia can be an absolute powerhouse of zero carbon energy, but it's stuck on this coal business. And, and that's what has to, has to end. Yeah, we could be a green superpower, as Ross Garner puts it. Finally, I, I would like to ask you a personal question. Um, there's a lot to be pessimistic about in the world, but throughout your career, you always take a more optimistic view. And so I, I wanted to know what inspires you about the world coming out of the COVID crisis? I think for all of the, uh, um, all of the battles that we're fighting right now, uh, the, the fun and the positive and the good uh, point is we can solve these things. Uh, we have uh, just incredible uh, knowledge, technology, wondrous science, smart people, uh, and a world that would like, uh, you know, a decent, normal world. Uh, and uh, that's, th that's my basic motivation, which is... Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit trapped uh, in the optimism side because I'm surrounded by people who have solutions to things. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a lowly economist, but uh, I'm surrounded by smart engineers, uh, by uh, you know, very sophisticated uh, virologists, by 
many people who tell me every day, yeah, here are solutions. I'm surrounded by energy engineers who've been telling me for 20 years, here are things we can do. So I think this is really the point. No reason to be pessimistic or, and certainly not to listen to those who say, you know, there's no solution, it's, uh, it's over. This is not right. But I, I, I think the, the point is uh, the politicians give us a run for our money. Uh, our, our capacity to cooperate uh, is, is definitely challenged daily. But uh, the fun part is to try to figure out how we can make it work right. Well, look, hopefully the work we do here at the Institute will contribute to this. But anyway, this is all what we have time for today. Professor Sachs, I wanted to thank you for sharing your thoughts on those uh, big and important issues. Great, great to be with you. And th thank you very much for the opportunity. I really hope that we'll be able to see you at the Institute in, in the flesh at some point. Uh, but in the meantime, I wish you the very best. And to you too. And looking forward to, to being back at Lowy Institute in person sometime soon. You've been listening to Lowy Institute Conversations, a podcast from the Lowy Institute, hosted by Institute Experts with production assistance from Josh Gotti. Thanks for listening. And we look forward to joining you for the next next episode of Low Institute Conversations.